Okay, I gotta try it again. Sorry, someone someone flipped the breaker here. Um, okay, let's try that again. So uh, today's lesson is on number six. So please go to the OSC design guide, lesson number six on the on a wiki. So design guide. Uh, electronics and circuits let's get so let's uh, begin it again so electronics in the framework of the global village construction set we also treat it as a construction set approach so we approach it from the idea of multiple easy to understand building blocks where we define what those building blocks are you don't necessarily have to know what's on the inside of that black box just like when you have a computer you don't necessarily have to know how the, the chips inside work in order to make use of it. You have an interface. So that metaphor can be extended to electronics, which for a lot of people tend to be black boxes. But we can treat them as usable, usable modules if we know some basics around them and how to, how to make them work. So getting into the actual design guide, uh, some basic circuits, circuits concepts. So circuits are analogous to, to fluid flow in terms of when you look at a circuit design, you have electricity flowing from high potential to low potential. That's actually similar to what we have in hydraulics or water or plumbing, where uh, in hydraulics, for example, when you run a, a tractor, you pump the fluid, it goes through all the components, it creates motion such as wheel drive or, or hydraulic cylinders and then it returns back to the pump. It's a closed circuit. So that same kind of metaphor applies to electronics where if you've got a circuit, you have to have the current flowing pretty much in a, in a circle and being converted into, into useful functions. What is the fluid in the world of electronics? It's electrons, which move near, near the speed of light. So circuits can have the capacity to, do, to perform calculations or other things that happen on very rapid time scales with electrons being the the particles that are actually operational there the analogy to water and hydraulics should be kept in mind to to make a good metaphor like when you design a circuit oh okay does it does it leak or does it actually close up on itself so it's a, it's a thing to start with um, so converting black boxes to usable things in a modularity perspective we talked about the the control panel, the universal control panel for for controlling the printer where we talked about various components in there such as the Arduino, such as the power handling elements. But in, in the circuitry, uh, the big concept that we, we do talk about in electronics is the idea of control and power and separating the two so that when you design things like a printer you've got a brain and then you've got another section of the circuit that's the power the small brain controls the the circuits which do which, which can do very massive things just like the brain in a human body takes very not so much energy but it can make us do like physical activity the brain controls physical activity in a human body you can think about the Arduino microcontroller as one of the key key tools key black boxes that we use to create usable usable functions, uh, so it's useful to talk about the generic idea of of brain circuits and power, where the brain circuit can cycle power on and off uh, rapidly through through devices such as transistors, relays. Uh, transistors are basically switches. So, so electricity is all about switching electricity on and off to make it do useful things. If you design a complex circuit, you have electrons flowing very fast through circuits in very complex patterns that end up <coughs> creating logic. The thing from uh, from the global village construction set perspective, it's it's very useful to to. Uh, to consider the power of a small microcontroller and the switching, the switches, the power handling elements 
such as FETs, MOSFETs, uh, which are all transistors. So transistors in various forms, whether they're like they go by various names, from IGBTs, which are insulated gate bipolar transistors, to FETs, field effect transistors. But basically, you you have a small signal turning on a much larger current. From the perspective of construction set OSC, on one side you have electronics that control things like 3D printers or brick presses and in another you have high power electronic devices where for example a welder a welder is a current source uh, you're feeding current a lot of current through through electrodes to melt metal uh, like whether stick welding or or wire based welding but how do you how do you typically utilize energy in the real world typically we have power outlets like 120 or 240 AC and we run a lot of different devices on that on that power in the workshop and if we can switch that power on and off we can control its level we can control its voltage so a powerful concept to be aware of is through a device like an Arduino you can turn that on and off rapidly to create useful devices like welders and induction furnaces of course with some support circuitry uh, so <clears throat> take the simplest absolute simplest example that we can actually potentially show that I mean if it, you know, we don't have too much time but uh, we, can, we can do that we do have so I think William brought some we have plenty of Arduinos and some field some transistors some MOSFETs yeah, we, can play with them. we can play with them but what you can see is that you, you can control that to the uh, connect that to the controller infrastructure where through Arduino and through the code using the Arduino environment you can actually program these devices which in the yesteryear largely they were analog devices and right now you can write code that executes various functions when you have the ability to use a microcontroller like Arduino and then a switching with high power handling elements so take a look at the simplest example of that it would be a welder so you're taking power from the grid and you can you can even do AC power so let's take the absolute ridiculous simplest example take AC power and welding does not work on 120 volts that would like really it won't work it would like short circuit like blow it out I think uh, welding occurs at about 20 between 10 30 volts or so so you need to step that down so how do you handle a 30 large 30 volts or like uh, 20 around 20 oh, okay around 20 or so um, s and then you can have things like spot welding which I think occurs at much higher voltage too but, but depending on what you're doing but take take for example the welder application if we wanted to do that <coughs> we want to design one from scratch how do you do that conceptually you have tons of power coming from the wall outlets limited by the circuit breakers in your house or in the workshop we say we've got 400 amps, amps of power coming from the utility um, that's more than enough for a lot of things but if you want to create a basic welder what you would do is you take that power uh, typically well good welders are better welders work on DC so you have a more even burn so you can take that alternating current from the grid and rectify it or otherwise you can use direct current without rectification direct current would be something like from photovoltaics so the first question is why do we have AC coming from the wall um, and that has to do with how it's generated typically AC is generated in power plants where you have rotors like turbines um, or steam engines and they're steam based turbines that generate power at the power plant so you're creating physical motion and magnets I mean all the electricity that we do today is pretty much steam whether it's nuclear they're converting water to steam and driving turbines and generating alternating current because the, the turbines themselves spin so they have a an oscillating waveform uh, so that, but in the reality of a solar based facility you can have DC where actually handling uh, you get more flexibility there because it's already rectified and for a lot of devices like for example a welder you want DC current so 
if you have AC coming out of the wall, you can rectify it with a basic device called a rectifier. Um, you can buy those off the shelf, very inexpensive, uh, converted to DC. So with a device like an Arduino, you can switch that on rapidly uh, with what's, I mentioned the word pulse width modulation. So the ability to turn voltage on and off rapidly allows you to control it. So in, in principle, you can convert any voltage level by turning it on rapidly. This is at kilohertz scale, so thousands of cycles per second. You, you are turning it on and off, and on average, therefore, it's a lower voltage because it's on for a certain time, off, then on for a certain time. And on average, it turns out to be a lower voltage. And so with a, yep. I just have a question. Are some of the applications desirable to have a very high frequency? Because like Arduino is like 65,000 hertz or something. Yes. Some application, but, or some settings, rather. Yeah, absolutely. With Arduino, Arduino is good for, I mean, at the very fundamental level, it's it's 32 megahertz. So I've heard you can do like... 32 even, megahertz? Arduino. Well, isn't it? Isn't that what an isn't Arduino it is? Well, it's no, kilohertz. kilohertz. Sorry, sorry. Kilohertz. Wow, megahertz. No, no, no. Hold on, hold on. The, the no, CPU itself, CPU? the CPU is CPU megahertz. Is megahertz for sure. but, That's like 32. But the actual PWM pins coming out are... Right. Default so... One 1,000 times a second, but you can go up to 64, 65. Yeah, yeah. I think you can actually go up even more than 65,000 per second, but, but easily. Well, this is what we were talking about hacking. Uh, ah. <laughs> when you talk about, so that's the pre-programmed Arduino. Arduino stuff that runs off libraries that are programmed in C. Mm -hmm. So that depends on how efficient your programming there is, but I think you can push those limits. That's why, like, this is not Arduino 101. That's Arduino graduate level kind of stuff. So not, not here really, but you can get up to uh, say 65 kilohertz. You do want, you do have some high frequency items that are out there for how certain things work, like uh, plasma cutters are high frequency. Um, there's different power electronic devices that might need it, but for the, say, take, take a simple welder. Uh, you're basically chopping up a voltage that comes out of the wall that you have rectified and turning it into a smaller value, say, such as uh, 20 volts. So in the simplest sense, it would be an Arduino that's got small leads like signal wires going to a, a sizable heat sunk power switch because if you t think about switching many many times a second that generates heat so those elements the the power handling elements typically have to be cooled down uh, but that's a um, that's an important concept basically of it's called switched switch mode power supplies idea being that you're switching current on and off to change its voltage and control it uh, so Say it again. Why voltage drop when you go switch? The idea is that you're switching it so fast that in practice you're seeing the average of that. So the average of a rapid on and off switch on on a kilohertz level gets you an average that is smaller. It it's higher. It, it may be important to note, I believe, that it's not just that you switch it faster and faster, but rather that you s that it is on for shorter periods of time. Yeah, so it's right. a lot for just a little bit, and then it's it's off for a long time, and then on for a little bit, and then off for a long time. So why you change the voltage? So that's called duty cycle. So if it's on, the whole say you're feeding in 120 volts, and the switch is on. You have the Arduino, instead of using a wall switch, you know, you let that transistor turn on, you're on, you're 120 volts. Now, what if you do on half the time, off half the time? Oh, on, off, okay, okay. Then you get 60 okay, volts. Okay. Yeah, oh, you get the average uh, off. Yeah, so depending yeah. on that duty cycle, you can you can transform that down to uh, to different quantities. And in, um, in a brute force application, such as a welder, which is just a re simple resistive load, it may work that like a two component electronic system you got the rectifier to turn the AC into DC and you've got the transistor that just does the switching um, 
that I believe is sufficient to do the most basic welder. So you can reduce, say, the 120 to to 20 volts by a one-sixth duty cycle thing. Um, yeah. Um, I know when you get into like motors, you have to worry about um, uh, like the impedance when you turn the motor off. Do you have to worry about the same thing in a in a welder application like that when you have a switch mode power supply? I don't think you do mm -hmm. because that's just the resistive load. You're just Turning current mm. on and on as yeah. a resistor, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. so it's like mm -hmm. like a dimmer on a light. Mm -hmm. um, if you turn it on very very rapidly, you see it just getting dim. It doesn't flicker. If it's fast enough, you can't see the flicker. Mm. Uh, or if it's fast enough, it doesn't respond fast enough to see that it's on and off. So it kind of goes almost like it goes analog on you. It's it's really like a, a fraction of the overall value. That's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah. Um, so this concept is very powerful for when you talk about power electronics in general and now of course uh, for more refined applications or like the Arduino power supply. That kind of a m method would not really work for Arduino because whenever you turn things on and off very fast you get spikes. You get dirty power. Uh, it's not clean. So you have to have a bunch of capacitors and inductors and other components that smooth out the quality of that signal. And therefore, the power supply that you saw today, uh, that big heat sink you saw there, was that field effect transistor, some kind of a transistor there, probably a MOSFET, that does that rapid switching. It's a switching power supply, but you saw it has many different components like throughout that board. That's all the infrastructure to clean that power, maybe provide things like over voltage or over current protection so it would detect if there's too much current and it would just shut it off and things like that. Um, but the idea of rapid switching using a, a $5 brain is very powerful because then you can be talking about, for example, the, the holy grail in the immediate term like melting metal induction furnaces which are um, more complex but you're still doing that switching there at high frequency. Um, basically, the way that induction works is that you're switching anywhere between like uh, a few kilohertz to hundreds of kilohertz. You're basically putting current through a load and that makes it heat up really hot uh, to the point of melting. Um, the idea there is the cost if you so when you understand that logic that okay you have you can do as simple as an Arduino you know there's various companies that make um, induction furnaces I don't think any of them use Arduino Arduino is sufficient to do it what you care about is is uh, the ability to switch a load on between a kilohertz and maybe up to a hundred kilohertz so your, the cost there is really the cost of the power handling elements and those are <coughs> very inexpensive these days um, to the tune of like a dollar per kilowatt or so uh, you can google um, you know any kind of digikey or some supplier of electronic parts you can see these power handling elements uh, are quite affordable so uh, and they're going down because this is electronics mass production semiconductors they're basically little semiconductor switches so as time goes on because of Moore's law with electronics the price keeps falling so um, things like the off-grid power supplies with inverters um, induction furnaces laser cutters plasma cutters uh, any kind of power supply that you need like say you want to run an electric car you want a voltage controller to a speed controller uh, to run that. Uh, the power handling elements at this point are very uh, very inexpensive and then the technology around that is understanding well what other support infrastructure you need around the switching as a common way of doing things. So you can either do switching which is switch called switch mode or you can go through a bunch of other electronic components that do the same. So you can either implement the functionality within code or you can use it by discrete components that each have a certain function um, and the way 
Uh, there's basically resistors, inductors, and capacitors, like the three main types of components out there. Um, and combining them in, in various funky ways, you get all kinds of behaviors from circuits. So I'll just talk about that in general. Um, but the kinds of functionalities, like you can design a circuit that uses a bunch of these components, you know, or you can design that through digital logic, um, like switching, like what, what I mentioned about switching a load on and off rapidly to reduce its voltage. You can do the same through a combination of capacitors, inductors, and so forth. But to me, the, the route of just writing some words on a computer screen to do that is easier than actually getting or making those components uh, to do those functions. So to simplify things, uh, we do have the advantage of the microprocessors and electronics uh, done that way. So what kind of electronics are relevant to us right now? Right now we, we definitely do the microcontrollers and simple circuits, um, like we talk about with the universal controller. We also um, we are interested in getting into milling or making circuit boards to, to make that easily doable. You can also, one, another way to make circuits for very interesting kinds of features is by 3D printing them. So what are some examples of 3D printed circuits? So maybe we can go to a page on a wiki called 3D printed circuits. To see some awesome examples, please pull that up. Um, so, 3D printed circle, circuits. Um, how, because circuits are really the, the concept that you're putting a bunch of components together without them short circuiting. You can't just throw them in a pile and like throw wires all, all over. You can, but you have to make sure that none of the pins are touching because you get short circuits. So the convenient thing to do is uh, to use circuit boards or you can even 3D print them. So this is an example of a 3D printed circuit where for the idea of isolation, the typical function that a circuit actually does, which is hold components in a convenient way so they can be all put together, why not 3D print that? Um, then you can put regular components on that. Now what does it look like on the back? Well, you still have to solder it on the back, but if you're doing milling circuits, let's say, and you're soldering onto them, it's quite similar to what you're doing right here. And on the back, on the back of this, that first circuit there, you can even have little ridges or channels where you bend the wires onto each other and even snap fit them into place. Now, that's po possible, maybe. Haven't done it. But you can definitely solder them on the back and by laying them out and putting them into channels that are already there for you, it's a very easy way to make circuits, meaning putting a bunch of uh, components onto a board. This is similar to what we're actually doing with the control panel because the control panel is actually a 3D printed structure onto which you fit other components. Now the components we're using are actually other circuits, uh, entire circuits. But we can also put onto that same control panel, you could put like if you wanted to, you know, a resistor or whatever, some other terminal, you can also put that in there. So it effectively functions like a circuit board. Uh, the common way to make circuit boards is either milling or etching, uh, surface mount or through hole. Surface mount means that the com components are being mounted not through holes through the circuit, but actually on the circuit itself. Um, this this kind of technique doesn't lend itself well to the surface mount components, which are kind of the smaller, more advanced, modern day stuff. But the through hole items, I mean, they'll never go away. There's things that always have leads, like, like this transistor here. That's typically what a transistor looks like. Uh, it has three leads. One is the signal and the two is the you know, two gates across which you're, you're switching. Um, you always have the idea of, of like wires and and pins, so this kind of a technique will always be be relevant, uh, it seems. And here, a uh, convenient way, like this is this looks pretty sweet because you, you you can connect wires right to it. You don't have to solder it like we were soldering our little uh, voltage reducer. Um, terminal blocks are a very effective way to connect wires. So 
circuits are effectively like how do you connect a bunch of wires together. So let's look at some other examples of what relevant 3D printing would look like. Well, here's another example of, <laughs> of mounting all the components. And this is kind of a crazy thing. It's called dead bug, bug soldering <laughs> because you take a chip and you turn it upside down and it looks like a dead bug. And it's air soldering, like you're just soldering components in midair. But what that actually is, is an Arduino. It's the Arduino chip, but you're putting everything <laughs> on top of it, the USB port and the other components necessary to support it, like a, like a reset switch. And maybe it's kind of hard to, you, you do have pins that are accessible for like inputs and outputs, but that's like a crazy simple thing you can do as well. Uh, as a radical example of what you can do. Another cool application, like take the, the 3D printed cordless drill, what we could do on there. So this is an example of a, of a circuit, circuits that are built into the plastic by using conductive, uh, I believe they're using conductive inks in there or something where they're embedding the circuits right into the three-dimensional shape. Uh, that's pretty cool because you can combine, when you talk about 3D printing, uh, on a flat circuit board like that, what happens when you do the cordless drill and you have to fit, so there's battery packs, a switch, maybe a speed controller uh, and connections to the motor, which are in a complex three-dimensional shape. In that case, it makes much sense to put, uh, to turn that flat board into the actual geometry of the, the handle or battery pack and, and attach components right to the three-dimensional shape using this principle of attaching electrical components to plastic components. I think that could be quite interesting because otherwise what you have is standard circuit boards which are flat and somewhat awkward to work with. They're flat whereas the geometry of a handle is a finely curved shape so why not take advantage of that finely curved shape and put the components right on top of that? Research has also been done into flexible circuits, but yep. I don't know how close those are to being able to be open source, but uh, yeah. the, there's technology for it. Yeah, flexible circuits means the substrate on which you're printing the circuits, like a, like a circuit board is typically very stiff, but yeah, you can uh, paste your conductive leads and your, your paths onto flexible things, just like they have flexible solar panels. That's an example of a, another flexible circuit. Uh, where the flexible panels are very lightweight. Uh, so, so good ways, and here's some really good examples of um, circuits and plastic 3D printing working together. Let's talk about, um, so applications real quick, so on page three, applications. Controllers, we've gotten just a basic level of expo exposure to the universal controller for robotic motion. Uh, combining, combining Arduinos and sensors, so sensors are really that feedback, like humans have feedback like eyes and ears and other sensors to navigate the environment. You can add logic and, and or so-called reason to, to microcontrollers by adding different sensors. So combining Arduino with all kinds of sensors that you can get these days. You can make your own uh, temperature controllers. Yeah. There's a um, a bag of controllers. You, I mean, sensors you can buy for the Arduino. There's like 50 of them for like yeah. 10 bucks. Yeah, yeah. So a lot, a lot of different applications. Like take take any kind of an automated um, automated system that you get off the shelf. A lot of that, the good thing about that is that those advanced semiconductor chips that are typically the sensors, yeah, they're available for dirt cheap and we have the ability to buy any of them at low cost to make all kinds of electronic devices. So, you know, like a, a infrared thermometer, you know, you can put a plastic case with an Arduino and a sensor that detects infrared radiation and converts that through the Arduino to a temperature you know, things like that. You name it, you can do everything from like a water misting system, a m mist timer system for your greenhouse, to your brick press controller, to a controller of a tractor uh, using Arduinos and sensors. Uh, you can add remote control where instead of communicating through wires, you, 
there's very easy accessible modules for going remote control um, and that's that's the what the the craze of internet of things is about it's like everyone now has a computer and a cell phone people are these days adding sensors to just about anything and connecting that to the internet <coughs> which is the the most grand surveillance scheme or data scheme you can use that for all kinds of purposes um, I guess um, from the security perspective a lot of people are concerned about it that you know people are grabbing data everywhere if you buy a different particular device um, and it's not open source one of the risks you might face is that well maybe it has some sensor that you don't even know what it's doing um, like maybe in your in your computers or whatever but but yeah it's very easy these days to connect um, through very tiny modules connect to the internet and capture data from just about anything with with self-contained power units that can last uh, I don't know how long they last but I mean just tiny little batteries that you have something embedded in an object that just lives there and can send send information back and be connected to the internet and one uh, note about security is one of the concerns is that a lot of these things aren't well protected that they don't they've been written poorly and they can be accessed from the internet and other people can read the sensor data so be aware of that try to look up your security stuff when you, if you're making these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so far we talked about very simple controllers like, like Arduino, but there's actually much higher power processors like the Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone. Those are two well-known uh, open source ones where the BeagleBone is very much open source. The Raspberry Pi is somewhat open source, but they're also very low cost uh, com basically small computers now a raspberry pi is so powerful and that even the pi raspberry pi zero which costs five dollars uh can that not run ubuntu um I, it does yeah raspberry pi zero like tiny but high power this is we're talking oh, no, about no, the tiny one but the, that's the regular one yeah raspberry pi three runs yeah. With full yeah, so you can basically take, like, the relevant thing from the Global Village construction set perspective is um, what about adding the closed loop material cycles to electronics? Well, we can. Like, when it comes to your cell phone, if you use a Raspberry Pi, there are open source uh, cell phone programs for Raspberry Pi. Uh, for us, the relevance would be things like open source cell phones tablets or small computers that you can now uh, run using open source platforms like the Raspberry Pi. So like a tablet, think of a 3D printed tablet, you can get touch screens really easily off the internet and that's doable and a lot of people are not doing that because of course you can get Samsung or whatever, your Apple, whatever, iPad, whatever. they're a little more refined but that kind of capacity is rapidly following the industry standards so that you can buy the screen, you can buy the high power processors and as simple as a Raspberry Pi uh, gets you to that amazing level of of uh, functionality and that's man right there are billions of dollars worth of products to be developed and, so, and a lot of people are developing um, open source wares like that there are uh, even Libre computers right now where the design blueprints for those computers are open source but the actual chips are not open source themselves so you, you can't you can uh, you have to buy the chips but you have information on how they connect together uh, but with a five dollar raspberry pi or maybe a twenty dollar more advanced raspberry pi uh, which is a tiny thing the same size as an arduino the thing we were holding it's that big but it's not 32 megahertz it's like close to a gigahertz these days right it's like higher I think one or two I gigahertz like 1.4 gigahertz i think was yeah. core speed with uh, four cores uh, the that's recent version shit, it's four cores. they uh, recently came out with yeah. uh, yeah, keep on yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it's insane and it's and it's getting better and accelerating um, you can so make a processor out of it right 
It is. It is a. It's a whole oh, computer. Yeah, it's this big, the size of a pack of cards. Wow. And it's just like yeah. Well, for ten dollars. Computer. Yeah. Getting cheaper. Well, ten dollars here in Canada. Wow. Yeah. Depends yeah. on who it's for. Nobody knows yeah. about this thing. So yeah. Like so that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, know about this because we can be making our own. Like I'd love to have my own pad, um, or even this computer. If it's based on Raspberry Pi, right now Raspberry Pi is not really great enough to do things like FreeCAD, which I use often and all that. Um, but it's getting there. But for a basic like surf the internet computer, email, pad, kind of a deal. Absolutely, let's get on that product and develop that because that's it's completely feasible. And you got touch screens that are, you know, what, twenty bucks, forty bucks. Or whatever for nice resolution um, I mean look at that some of these prices start looking at it but mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing there are certain certain op open projects out there like zero phone which is um, an open source phone based on a Pi zero which is the five dollar chip so you get a relatively inexpensive phone but even if it cost you a hundred bucks for that phone you're talking a lifetime design because you can modify all the components forever and you can replace them, you can upgrade them. That's the beauty of that once again. It's not that you necessarily pay less up front because you can, you can hardly compete with industrial system of mass production, but you can knock the socks off it because it's not going to live for one or two years, it can live forever. So you've got a factor of 10 to 100 of, of value increase by, by doing this. Um, specs. Man, 1.5 gigahertz. This is Raspberry Pi. Four core. Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, this version, I think, is 35 bucks, which is, I think, has been their their price for the for the big version. Mm -hmm. That ends in point. That's for the, uh, the 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 half size one, I think, is, is usually five yeah. or ten bucks. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're looking at the Raspberry Pi here on the screen uh, behind us. This is the i5. Um, yeah. So pretty amazing power and, and it lends itself, I mean the practical products are open source phones, open source tablets and, com and basic computers that today are absolutely doable. You've got the 3D printers for the case, you've got the chips that you embed, the, the microprocessors, the, the Raspberry Pis and other components that you can embed in that what and make a very... And make a very attractive product. I mean, maybe it won't be as tight packed as the other one, but it can still be very small. Like for a phone, it will be completely for for a tablet, completely practical, absolutely completely practical. It will be the same size as a regular tablet, um, and all of that. So so that's worth doing. Uh, Comment. What part of the Raspberry Pi is it open source? Is it just the chips, or do you know? Um, it's the central chip. The, the central AG, chip. Uh, what is it called? The ARM? ARM the ARM chip. processor? Yeah, whatever yeah. that processor is called. Well, the facts about chips are none of the chips are open source, yeah. but it's also about the interfaces and protocols it uses. Like, they don't even show you the... I don't think the they show you the set. entire schematic of the actual board, like how everything connects like to each other. Pinout and everything, yeah. Uh, pin you would have, but not the actual the wire. The actual circuit diagram, you know, mm -hmm. which says how this part connects to the other, mm -hmm. whereas BeagleBone shows oh, you that everything. absolutely. Even have the, the chips? Full, it shows you what the chips are, but as I said, the chips are not chips open source, are. The, the chips themselves. Got it. Uh, yeah. But there was a project on, on a crowdfunding platform recently that was to do an open source chip for the Arduino equivalent. Mm. Uh, that didn't get funded, oh. but yeah, that's doable, and as I mentioned, uh, the other day, you do have chip design software that's open source. That you, if you want to get going on that, you have documentation and communities that do that already. So get involved and, and make it happen. Um, right, and then so you say you design it in the open source software, and then you export it and give it to a fabrication shop, the, one of those big chip manufacturers. A lot of them take contracts, and you can get a bunch of them produced. So. So that's all doable. So what are the, some of the open source design tool chains? I mentioned there's up to the, the uh, microprocessor chip design. All of that is open source. You've got KiCad, K-I-C-A-D. 
which is the key open source designer which allows you to export files that say you want to CNC mill them or give them to a fabrication mm -hmm. shop to make your circuits you've got also some certain analysis software like um, I forget what the name is but you can simulate how a circuit will behave um, so so tools that assist you with the actual design there's other more like human centric packages instead of KiCad there's Fritzing a package called Frit Fritzing it's once again it's open source and it allows you to design simple circuits it's more like drag and drop style um, uh, the, the, the package that's the, the open source simulator of circuits is called Qux, Quite Universal, Universal Circuit Simulator. That's what it is. And um, then you get into the, design, the designs themselves of how you, how you understand. Well, if you're working with comp like the unveiling of the black boxes, you can work with Arduinos. And there's a lot of, lot of information on Arduino. Um, go to arduino.cc. And you can Google Arduino this, Arduino that, like Arduino-based spot welder, Arduino-controlled vacuum cleaner, the, one of those robotic vacuums. You name it, Google it, and you'll see it. So it's it's pretty robust and active for what what you can do. Uh, if you have the actual physical circuit designs designed in KiCad, you can actually export them into FreeCAD, so you can look at them in 3D with all the components. They have the part libraries for them. Uh, too, so that kind of stuff is is available, um, but um, yeah, the 3D printed phone, the modular 3D printed phone, the modular 3D printed tablet. I think those are two high priorities that every single p person on the planet could do. So we talk about uh, products that have a billion dollar or more market; those certainly qualify for that. So uh, if someone wants to start a business doing that, uh, that would be awesome and. And there's a little bit of a learning curve, but, but there's a lot of good information on, on the ra Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, Beagle Bones that people can access pretty readily to, to make use of all of that. Uh, building circuits. Um, how do you build a circuit? The only thing we've done around here is uh, I can only speak for the circuit mill. Maybe William can talk about how he. he etches circuits. We will take those two simple cases which are very much DIY capable. If you go to the D3D CNC circuit mill page on the wiki you can download the blueprints for our circuit mill and actually start milling them and you have to buy the copper clad boards which are like a dollar a piece or so or how, however much they are uh, and then you can make your own circuit uh, on these boards. Putting, so basically what a circuit mill does is it etches, it, it uh, mills away the complex circuitry pattern, which is the substitute for you having to carefully um, wire up a bunch of components to one another. It, it kind of the basic idea of what a circuit is. It's like an organized way to put all your components onto. So circuit mill is a one way to do it. And we talked about the 3D printed circuits as placeholders, or the the control panel, the universal control controller that we're doing as another it's like a circuit too because it's essentially a, a board to which you mount all kinds of electronic components. Um, PCB milling um, is one way but the other way is etching so William can you briefly describe mm -hmm. the the way you you can do that so using solution. We have uh, these little electrical boards that are like this. Can you speak up for the people remote? So they're they're copper covered PCB boards about maybe three inches by five inches. And we start actually with a piece of regular computer paper and have the students draw out their circuit. You can see that in the white. I don't know if anyone at home uh, can see it. But basically just draw with straight lines and the marker on a piece of um, computer paper. And then put little circles where you want the pads to be. And it's drawn bigger than the eventual size. And so then what we do is we photocopy it and shrink it to the size of about three by five inches, and then photocopy it onto glossy paper. It's important to have glossy paper because the photocopy toner does not stick as well to the glossy paper. So once you have a three by five inch printout, you cut it out and put it face down onto the copper board. 
You have to be very sure to clean the copper board. Make sure there's no residue, no fingerprints. We scrape it down with steel wool and we have this stuff called Goo Gone. And we scrape it down with that and make sure it's very, very clean. Then we put it down onto the copper board and tape it. And then we put it about 20 times through a laminating machine. <laughs> so the laminating machine heats it up and transfers the toner. I have a feeling you could probably also use an iron or some other ways. We just used the, the laminating machine and it was fine. So finally we've got this. When you take it out of the laminating machine after it's 20 times through, you'll see that the circuit pattern has been etched on to the board. So the final step is to go up to the chemistry lab and make sure the chemistry teacher is there and the fume hood is all good because the next part is a little dangerous. It's not something you want to try unless you have a little bit of chemistry background or experience. So we essentially take muriatic acid, which is used for pools, balancing the pH of pools, with a kind of a mix of hydrochloric acid at a certain concentration, and then off the shelf again, uh, some hydrogen peroxide, 3%. Both of them are readily available. The first one for about $6 Canadian, from the local hardware store, and the other one's about $3 from the pharmacy. So we put them in a two to one ratio, two parts hydrogen peroxide to one part muriatic acid, and then we throw the circuit board in there in a plastic container. Very important plastic, you don't want to be using metal unless you really like experiencing chemistry firsthand. <laughs> <laughs> so use a plastic container, etch it in there, it takes about five or six minutes if the peroxide is still good. You'll note that peroxide is in a uh, it's an opaque container. One thing we learned the hard way, we left it overnight uh, a few nights for the weekend, came back on Monday, it didn't work. It turns out the peroxide degraded. So it didn't work. We have to use fresh peroxide or keep it in an airtight uh, opaque container so that it's fine. So the circuit etches off very nicely. You clean it off with lots of water. Make sure you've cleaned up and didn't leave any drips of muriatic acid around. Make sure you're using a fume hood when you're doing that because it's very noxious, the fumes, and well ventilated, whatever it is. And then we have our circuits. Uh, so we did that as part of a computer engineering class this year. And we're making a whole set of circuits. One of the applications could be to uh, be a control board for the OSC motor. We'd like to completely open source that. That might be a little ambitious, but at very least we can make basic circuits like a butt converter like this. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, so that kind of wraps up the, the big picture overview of what we know about circuits. Um, I'll be adding more details as we go forward. So, any questions from the remote audience or anyone here? on circuits and their relevance to the Global Village construction set? I just wanted to add about that, uh, uh, that process of uh, etching the circuit. I actually did this uh, once. I didn't really know what to do with the... Uh, it, it actually, it, the, the fluid actually turns turned to green on the yes. copper. Yes. Is there a way to uh, like get that, like, recycle that? Like, yeah, the you can use it again and again as long as you keep it in the dark. And that's the problem we had. We had clear containers like this, mm -hmm. so the light, <laughs> it degraded the peroxide, and it was no good. So you just have to find an opaque container, and you should be able to use it again and again, according to the internet. I haven't tried that, because mm -hmm. we only did them in very small batches, and we just threw it out at them. Is it possible to get the, the copper back out of there? I think so. I think you can reconstitute the copper, because once it's all green, there's copper and stuff in there. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Are we good? Okay. So that sounds good. And that will wrap up the lesson for, for the afternoon today. And let's get back to the workshop then. And um, we are still at the control panel. And after that, as soon as we're done with that, we move on to the heat bed, which is a combination of nichrome wire, We've got some metal parts in there, basically connecting the micro wire and casing that in fiberglass sleeve so that it doesn't um, doesn't short circuit anywhere, and putting insulation around that uh, in, a, in a structure that looks similar to what you see on a printer in a workshop, but it's a little uh, next version of that, which is much more uh, solid. Because one of the things you want to have is a very solid print bed surface so that you can go fast without shaking your print 
like as I mentioned about inertia, if you go fast with a print head, you, you do a lot of shaking. Um, so what you want is a very stiff bed that does not move even when you're going very fast with a 3D printer. So we're using steel and, and clay enclosed steel structure. And the last version what I used was sheet metal, which is like flashing for a house. Uh, and I cut out a, a shape out of that. But it's uh, not strong enough that it tends to wobble a little bit uh, more than I would like. Uh, and you want absolute stiffness down to a fraction of a millimeter, like it cannot move by less than the layer width or even the step width. You, you want it to be absolutely stiff. So we're going to build that um, today and cut the length of wire to, to size and encase it in a, in a fiberglass sleeve, put, connect it, put, uh, add wires to that and also add a thermistor to that whole system so we can read the temperature from inside the, the heat bed. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty nice nice experiment and practical thing because you can use that kind of technology to make heat guns, to make furnaces for melting like aluminum, not any kind of a device that has a heater element like a toaster oven or a dryer for clothes which dryers today are run by electricity which means they have a heater element you're converting electricity into heat in a dryer um, or any any device that that where you're required to have heat so you can make your cooktop you know from that kind of same system or like a hot plate for chemistry or anything like that or or a heater for chemistry mm -hmm. yeah. radiant floor for radiant flooring unless you have really really abundant uh, uh, electricity from the sun yeah, it's a, a, turning electricity, which is a high-grade form of energy, into heat, uh, temper, into temperature. That's wasteful, but it is 100% efficient. So <laughs> you're wasting all of it. <laughs> so that's great efficiency. Okay, so I think we can wrap up with that. Get back into the workshop and continue on a build because we are doing the open source chain gang tonight, and I'm in. We've got Devin, Justin, John, maybe some other people. Scott the Eternal, he's in there. And now we're going to end off with our control panel build in the background. Did you know who made this shirt? Our homeboy, Peter McCoy, the mycologist that's been here twice. Yeah? Yeah. It's actually a reference to Maria Sabina from Mexico, who in the 1950s brought our Gordon Wasson, who's at the botanist. Uh, introduced him to psilocybin and she called her mushrooms her children, so save the children is a reference to psychoactive compounds, but yeah. <laughs> 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 I was wondering what was going on with the material this morning. Yeah, I think Matthew who's been here a few times uh, for different courses, made it, so they can bring it up. And there it's a circuit of mycelium, not electricity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some of the largest networks on this planet. Yeah. Uh, the largest organism on the planet is mycelium, isn't it? That's true. Yeah. It's bigger than a whale. It's bigger than internet. What is it? I mean, it's mycelium. That's one organism that just spread so far through miles, and it's the largest living, known living organism. So say it's in the Yeah. It's bigger than a whale, yeah. or a dinosaur. It's bigger than the largest tree. Yeah. That's amazing. But that's what kind of keeps the soil together. Like, if you kill the fungi, your soil all washes away because the mycelium keeps it together. Yeah. Just like the internet has the potential to keep society alive. Or not. Okay. Um, Let's see, one question, is it possible to 3D print the conductors, wires on a circuit board? Yes, you can. There are conductive pastes that you can 3D print. However, they're not as conductive as pure copper. So you're going to get a factor of maybe like, it's not great. You can do small circuits with that. But for really high precision, like very fine circuits that require very fast uh, oscillations or or long distances of leads, uh, you're going to get into trouble. But for very basics, like connecting LEDs and, and small basics, you can. 
And that may get better in the future as we discover some, some pastes that are, that when they settle, they're very highly conductive. But right now, that doesn't really exist. There's at least two orders of magnitude. I think it's more than two orders of magnitude, like 100 or 1,000 times less conductivity. It will work for basics, but not for power, not for high power. It will just evaporate from the heat. So, yep. Okay, so thank you very much. We'll continue tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. and finish our printers today. Thanks, everybody.